Hare Krishna. Welcome to our Sunday program in the Krishna Temple Zurich. Willkommen zum Sonntagsfest im Krishna Temple Zurich. Versteht jemand kein Englisch? You understand English, right? The question was, who doesn't understand English? You understand? Good. <laughs> who is here for the first time? <laughs> I don't understand English either. <laughs> Your English is probably one of the best in this room. So, okay, welcome. So nice that you came. So now we're going to have a lecture and we're very fortunate today we have with us His Holiness Chandra Moli Swami Maharaj. Hari Where is he? Oh. <laughs> So, just a brief introduction for those of you who don't know Maharaj. His Holiness uh, is originally from the US and he joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement in 1973. That's exactly 50 years ago. So he has been practicing Bhakti Yoga for 50 years and for many years he's sharing knowledge, traveling all over the world. He's in the renounced order of life, a sannyasi. And he's also an initiating spiritual master in our movement. So he has disciples who he guides and he also guides us today. So we are very fortunate and thank you so much, Maharaj, for coming. I need some guidance. <laughs> <laughs> Got any suggestions? <laughs> okay. Huh? Sing? Okay. Is that what you usually do? <laughs> okay. I was thinking of telling jokes today. <laughs> Maybe it wouldn't work. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Do you all know the song? It's Bhajan. You can follow it on your phones. It's called Nama Kirtana, or we also know it as Yasamati Nanda. Mm -hmm. Should I? Anybody who doesn't are not familiar with that one? Yasamati Nanda. Everybody knows it. Okay, good. Can play. Yaso mati nandana brajavara nagara gokula ranjana ha 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 Hey, 
question, see if you can get the answer. Ready? Yes. Okay. What would you call a person who comes every day to Mangalarti right at the end? Huh? A late comer. A late comer. Very good. A member of the fan club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will give you another one. <laughs> what do you call a person who comes right after that? What's next? The Club. Hmm? The member is Alliance Club. <laughs> Swing it there. <laughs> okay. Ready? What do you call a person who comes right after that? What's next? What follows Ms. Shrinker Dave? Okay. What club are they in? The Garden Club. <laughs> okay. All right, we got three more. What do you call a person who comes after that? It's Japa time. A member of the Rotary Club. <laughs> okay, ready for the next one? <laughs> what do you come call a person who comes right after that? Member of the book club. Okay, we'll go for the last one. Everyone should be a member of this club, I'm sure. <laughs> What's after Bhagavatam? Member of the Breakfast Club. <laughs> okay, so you can choose what club you want to get into. Okay. All right, that's the whole class. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Hare Krishna. Any suggestions for a topic? I didn't, I didn't think of anything to say. Give me a suggestion. Except for, you know, what's happened in the stock market. You know, we thought I'm not so good at that one. Yes? The importance of the spiritual master. The importance of the spiritual master. Make sure you give him money, garlands, <laughs> and don't forget his birthday. <laughs> okay. Any questions? <laughs> okay, the importance of the spiritual master. Om Gyan Timirandasya Gyana Jana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manovistam Stapditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Gadamai Yam Dadanti Swampadanti Kam Pande hum shigaro shiyuta pade kamalam shigarun vaishnavam scha 
Sri Rupam Sadrujatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahita Krishna Chaitanya Deva Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Chagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostite Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhi Vrindavane Smri Vrishabhanu Bhakti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Vepacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Srivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We just recently celebrated the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Baladev. Baladev, Balaram, is known as Guru Tattva. <laughs> now all the manifestations of the principle of Guru come from the Tattva of Lord Balaram. Balaram is called Guru Tattva, or the original spiritual master. And we see, we heard, and we also discussed that um, Lord Balaram is in the mood of servitor Godhead, although he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He serves the Supreme Lord, Sri Krishna, in his different incarnation as he appears within the material realm. And so this is the mood that he's teaching, both for his own pleasure, he likes to serve in the mood of the, the uh, servitor Godhead, although he is the Supreme Lord himself. But he's also teaching the mood of what is the principle of devotion. It's the mood of service. And those who take the position of representing the Supreme Personality of Godhead by the mercy of the Supreme Good become empowered to serve the Lord by giving, guiding others in the process of serving the Lord. So Krishna is very merciful, so one of the manifestations of his mercy is Guru. And that way he teaches what he wants from us in terms of the mood and the process of servitorship through the representative who is considered to be, at least in principle, as the topmost of all servitors. Because the mood of a certain spiritual master is that he only has one desire, and that is to teach others to please his spiritual master by guiding them in the process of devotional service through philosophy and through practical guidance. The principle of Guru Tantra is quite complex. Uh, to understand what actually is the role of the spiritual master, there's always been a discussion that has been going on for many, many, you might say, millenniums, because the spiritual master also is also serving the Supreme Lord in the mood of teaching others how to serve, to serve the Lord, but he's also doing his own service to the Lord. So we might say he knows the way, he goes the way, and he shows the way. All of these there is one who is qualified to teach. The Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made the principle of, of servitorship Godhead or Guru very simple in a de definition that he applied. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling through South India, he stopped in one particular home. In fact, he was, a, he was invited by the person. He was a Brahmana. <laughs> and he stopped in Kormashetra. So this Brahman was known as the Kurma Brahman, and he was a very, what we say, to use the Sanskrit terminology, Paka Brahma. In other words, he was ideal in Brahminical culture. 
And he recognized the importance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He invited him to stay in his home. The Lord accepted the invitation and the Lord stayed for four days. And during those four days, the Brahmin, along with his family members, served the Lord in so many different ways, in such a way that the Lord was so pleased, both by their service and by their loving devotion, that he gave them his full blessings. But during that time, they also became very attached to him. <laughs> their attachment for the Lord was so strong that when it was time for the Lord to continue on his trip, mission, to travel throughout since South India, they didn't want him to go. But when the Lord makes up his mind, he goes. Of course, he was, he was very much uh, aware of the sentiments and he tried to pass them, pacify them as much as he could. But when love reaches a certain level of feeling, pacification doesn't work. <laughs> so in that case, they weren't really able to accept the fact that he was leaving, but there was no doubt that this was going to happen. So he left. But the Korma Brahmin couldn't t take it, so he, leave, he left his family and start following Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his uh, walking. After some time, the Lord turned around and he saw that the Brahmin was following. He stopped, turned around, came up. Where are you going? I'm going with you. You can't go with me. You have your family. You have your responsibility. What will people say? How will your family continue? And so many words, the Brahmin didn't respond to Lord Chaitanya's statement. He pretty much said, I'm coming with you. <laughs> His uh, desire to be with the Lord was so strong. We also saw that when Lord Chaitanya left the planet after many years, his devotees who had associated with him while, the, while he was here, many of them, the separation from the Supreme Lord was so strong that they couldn't bear that separation. So many of them followed and gave up their bodies in meditation just to, again, get dissociation with the Lord in the spiritual world. And uh, so the Lord, of course, needed to say something to pacify this Brahmin. He had tried earlier. But now he said, actually, you know, if you want to be with me, do two things. He said, if you do these two things, you'll never lose my association. He said, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. Whoever you meet, teach them to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He said, by my command, be guru, save the land. And if you follow this simple instruction, then you're always, you're always with me because this is my mission. I've come to give the conditioned souls bhakti and the process of bhakti through the chanting of the holy name. So by assisting the Lord in his uh, mission, one is actually associating with the Lord in principle. And that association is even more real, you might say, or more fulfilling than personal association. This personal association with the spiritual master is the, the terminology is called vapu. There's two things, vani, which means instructions, and vapu. Uh, vani is considered to be the foundation by which association develops and continues. When the spiritual master departs, or if he's not, if you're not in physical association, then we follow the instructions. The instructions are actually coming from Krishna uh, through the spiritual master to guide this, the person back home, back to Godhead. That's the only business of a spiritual master. He's not in there. He's not. His business is not to get garlands or get his birthday celebrated. <laughs> That's not the, that's not the, uh, that happens. That's a way of honoring the spiritual master. But the real way to honor the spiritual master is to understand, learn, hear from, and imbibe those instructions and make those instructions one with one's life. Yasya Devi Prabhaktir 
yada devi tukha guru tasyaita pratite karta prakasananda mahatmanaha one who has implicit, and the word implicit means without any doubt, but the one who has implicit faith in both the spiritual master and the supreme personality of Godhead, all of the teachings of the Vedic knowledge is automatically revealed within the heart of that practitioner. That is the power of bhakti, and that is the power of faith, both in Guru and Krishna. But to develop that faith, we have to associate with those instructions. And we also look for opportunities to take advantage of the spiritual master's mercy by going for getting personal association. And that is called Vapu. We see that many devotees who are uh, fixed in Krishna consciousness, particularly those who are disciples of Srila Prabhupada, had much association with Prabhupada, and they developed a real love for Srila Prabhupada. And based on that love, um, they were willing to do anything to carry out his instructions in spreading Krishna consciousness. But if that is not there, then if we associate with the spiritual master, and do not understand the instructions or the guidance that's given with the purpose of that association, then we will, we will somehow or other not really gain anything from that association. Because Prabhupada says vapu, which means personal association, is like two-pronged. It can go one way or the other. It can bring one closer to the spiritual master in devotion, or it can bring one farther away. If for some reason we don't follow or we find some reason to find fault with the spiritual master. Like sometimes his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, would give a lecture and he would quote a verse wrong. <laughs> or he would quote the verse differently than the verse from the Shastra. And sometimes devotees would wonder, he's making a mistake. <laughs> he doesn't know the verse. So that, that came up in one discussion. But if one sees that as some flaw, then they take the spiritual master as being ordinary. He's, uh, he may also have the same activities that we have. In other words, he may have a family. He may have had activities that were contrary to devotional life before he took the position of spiritual master. But all of these things are wiped away by the power of Krishna's mercy when one fully surrenders to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so if we somehow see these material tendencies or material activities in the life of the spiritual master as being less than spiritual, and then we minimize the presence of the spiritual master. Then we can pick and choose, well, I like this instruction. I don't like this instruction. This instruction is more or less easily executable, and this one is not. And so then, then the devotee falls down to the what is called the platform of mental speculation. And not seeing that the instructions of the spiritual master are actually the instructions of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But what actually is a spiritual master? How do we really understand what is a spiritual master? So everything is understood by characteristics and by activities, both, not just by activities, but certain characteristics. The spiritual master will enlighten his disciples or those who come to him, not only disciples, but people in general, in understanding who is Krishna. Srila Prabhupada would say, if it's one who presents himself as a spiritual master, but doesn't talk about or glorify the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then they are not a spiritual master. Even though they may know all the Vedas, <laughs> they may be able to memorize and recite the Vedic literatures, you know, carte blanche, just not automatically. 
Still, the essence of the spiritual master's relationship with the disciple and others who come is to teach him about Krishna. <laughs> teach him how to serve Krishna. Who is Krishna? What is our relationship with Krishna? And how to develop that relationship. And that is the essence of the spiritual master's teaching. So one can judge from that perspective. So we might say now, maybe some of you haven't come to that platform of accepting a spiritual master yet. Maybe you're thinking about it, or you're working up to that point of actually uh, considering it. Then there is a what is called a, a time for association. That association, again, is of two times personal association, which you, the process of hearing, and the other, the pro, that the process of hearing without the personal association. And then one, just like somebody was asking me just, I think it was today or yesterday, how do we find a spiritual master? Yeah, it was actually, I think, earlier in the day today. And my response was through the process of shravanam, process of hearing. So by hearing regularly, and trying to understand what we hear, asking questions when there is need for clarification, and not only asking questions, but being eager to understand how to apply the answers in a practical way in our day-to-day -day life. Sometimes people ask the spiritual master questions just because they want to be known as a question asker. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> And when, when I used to do that to Prabhupada, the person would ask question after question. Prabhupada would say, you know, when you're eating, you have to digest before you can take the next bite. So, have you understood what I've told you before you can go on to the next topic? So, understanding means to contemplate what is the meaning. And if we can understand clearly and go ahead, then that then, then is success. But if there's any slight doubt of how to apply the knowledge in practical, then questions are there. And then therefore one has to be inquisitive because inquisitive never are, or relevant questions clarify the principles of bhakti and the instructions of the spiritual master where one can become enthusiastic to execute devotional service. If we hear and we try to understand, but we don't understand clearly or theoretically, then we need to clarify that through the process of uh, questions and answers. Um, the spiritual master, also some of his other characteristic is, he has no other business than Krishna's business. <laughs> he doesn't do like, well, you know, He's out there doing, you know, some kind of material job in order to further his situation in the material world. And he does spiritual masters and as a sideline. No, it's not a spiritual master. And one who is 24-7, you might say, completely fixed on serving the Lord and also teaching others. And Krishna, in the Bhagavad Gita, he gives a very simple formula how to approach the spiritual master. Tadvidi prasipastena pariprasyena sevaya upadeksyanti te gyanam gyaninam tatpadarshanaha. And this is from the Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, verse number 34. In there, um, the Lord is saying, approach the bona fide spiritual master, uh, ask questions and be ready to serve. Pradipatena, Pradiprasyena, and Sevaya are the three principles. Pradipatena means humbly, with a desire to understand. Pradiprasyena means the questions, inquisitiveness. Just like what are the most important questions you can ask the spiritual master? Prabhupada was talking, I was listening to him today. He was saying, people come to the spiritual master. One lady came to him and she said, I have a pain in my leg. Can you give me some medicine or give me some advice how I can overcome this leg pain? Prabhupada said, we can do that, but then after some time the pain comes back. 
or you have another problem. Now that's not the business of it. He said, if you want that kind of help, go to the doctor. That's what they're for. <laughs> or someone who knows. He said, the spiritual master is meant to, you know, guide you back home, back to God. And that's his, that's his uh, fixation. And so he does whatever he can, both for his disciples who have accepted him in that position and to others that he preaches to to bring them somehow closer. And the essence of the spiritual master's teaching when Srila Prabhupada was asked, what is your most important instruction uh, to your disciples? And he said, my most important instructions to my disciples is that every day on beach they chant 16 rounds without fail. <laughs> Very simple. And it's the essence of the practice of spiritual life is to glorify the Lord and chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra regularly as a vow. Sometimes devotees who haven't come to that stage of initiation yet, they chant when they want. <laughs> Whether they chant six rounds one day, eight rounds another day, 24 rounds another day, next day no time for chanting. And it's just all over the place. There's no commitment in that. In other words, spiritual life means to make a commitment. Make some kind of sacrifice, personal sacrifice, in order to practice bhakti. And therefore, the sacrifice of time, the sacrifice of uh, putting everything else aside and focusing on our spiritual life. And these are certain sacrifices, and sometimes we get an instruction from the spiritual master. There's two kinds of devotees, though devotees who have their relationship with the spiritual master based on the general instructions that the spiritual master gives. In other words, in his lectures, if he's writing books, like that. And there's others who get specific instructions directly from the spiritual master. Both are considered equal, but those who get specific instructions, then that becomes uh, easy, and it's a special mercy that if they simply can fulfill that instructions, carry it out with determination, then they make nice advancement. And Srila Prabhupada had disciples that were both. Some he told them go to different places, open up temples, just like the, the opening up the whole German Yatra was done by one devotee whose name was uh, Shivananda. Now he was he was 19 years old, all alone. Prabhupada sent him to Germany. He said, "Preach in Germany, start start Krishna consciousness in Germany." 19 year old boy just joined the, the Hare Krishna movement. Very obedient, but that's all. He was all alone, and Prabhupada sent him. And now he has to do this mission by himself, and he did it. He he, he got to Germany. And just by his own efforts, he just sitting down with some cartoons and some Maha Mantra cards, he was chanting Hare Krishna. And gradually people became interested. And then soon people came and then gradually they started to meet in different places. And soon there was enough people and then they opened the first temple. So this was, Prabhupada would do that. He would give sometimes impossible instructions. <laughs> okay, you, you leave everything and you go here and you open up a temple. Or you do this service or you do that service. That's considered special mercy. But the general principle is to um, understand and hear from the spiritual master. So, following the spiritual master's instructions is not so easy because um, it requires sacrifice. Because the spiritual master's instructions is to break your attachment to the material world. <laughs> Gradually, to free you from your desire to enjoy in this world and bring you closer and closer to Krishna through executing the activities an in devotional service. And sometimes we find there's a, uh, well, not a, what's the word, a conflict between the two. 
But that's special mercy. <laughs> and that's special mercy. And Prabhupada, I mean, at least I can use Prabhupada as the example. I don't know how other spiritual masters guide their disciples. Prabhupada gave some very hard instructions. I'll give you an example. Prabhupada was translating the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And he was sending the different translations to the BBT in uh, Los, Los Angeles. This was in 1975. So he would finish one volume, send it to the BBT, and they would, you know, do the editing. They would do the, you know, the, the uh, layout of the book, place the pictures, also make pictures, do the binding, and ultimately do the printing. And so it took two months average to do one volume of what Prabhupada was giving. So they had done two volumes. In those days, the Chaitanya Charitamrita set was 17 volumes. <laughs> so Prabhupada came to Los Angeles and he said, I have finished the entire work of Chaitanya Charitamrita. There's 15 volumes that needs to be you know, edited, pictures, printed, binded, everything. So I want it done in one month. They were doing one volume in two months. Now he's asking for 15 volumes in one month. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, that's impossible. That's, that's how they responded. Prabhupada said, this is the famous statement. You might have heard it. Prabhupada said, impossible? A word in a fool's dictionary. <laughs> and then they gave different reasons why they couldn't do it. Prabhupada wouldn't listen. He said, get it done. One month, 15 volumes. He gave him all the work. So Rameshwar and uh, Radha Balava. Radha Balava was the temple president. Rameshwar was the, the spiritual master there, or spiritual leader at the time. They, uh, they had a conference. And they said, Prabhupada's serious. <laughs> He wants 15 volumes in one month. We're only doing, you know, one volume every two months. So they thought, what are we going to do? He's not going to change his mind. <laughs> so they tried all different arguments to try to convince Prabhupada they couldn't do it. And Prabhupada wouldn't hear it. Get it done. <laughs> That's all. And so they came up with a plan. They said, Prabhupada, all right. We'll do it. But we have one request. You stay here for the whole month. <laughs> Little bargaining with the guru. <laughs> Prabhupada said, all right, I will. And he did. He stayed for, there for that whole month. And so they, there's about 150 devotees in the temple at the time. So they put the whole temple on 24-hour service. In other words, everyone worked around the clock for editing, printing. They needed pictures. Prabhupada had also asked for certain paintings to be made for the, for the book. So the painters, the artists, were working on their paintings and devotees were bringing them their prasadam. They were sleeping there and waking up and then continuing with their painting. So this went on for one month and around the clock. Everyone was on full throttle, just trying to get Prabhupada's request fulfilled. Fifteen volumes. It's good for temple presidents to hear this. <laughs> and uh, in, in one month they had done it. They did it. Fifteen volumes they, were, they did in one month before they could only do one volume in two months. So Prabhupada could understand, yeah. A little push is needed sometimes <laughs> to, uh, you know, should bring out the qualities of the Vaishnavas, the mood of surrender, the mood of, uh, the mood of uh, willing to do anything to satisfy the instructions of the spiritual master. And if you, of course you maybe have, if you see those volumes, those 15 volumes, they're beautiful. 
excellent. The quality, the paintings, the binding, everything was done, not only done, but done in an expert way. Prabhupada was so pleased. You can read about this particular pastime. It's mentioned in one book that was written by Tamal Krishna Goswami called Servant of a Servant. He speaks about that pastime in, in, uh, in that particular volume that he wrote. So Prabhupada would do that sometimes. And he would just give you the impossible. <laughs> just to help us to surrender more. Because Krishna does, Krishna, he doesn't see what you're giving, he sees what you're holding back. <laughs> That's Krishna. Oh, you're giving? That's nice. What else can you give? <laughs> a little bit more, a little bit more. Oh, all right, you're doing good, keep going. <laughs> a little more. So that's the mood of the spiritual master, is to push the disciples a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, until they're, they throw up their hands and say, I can't do it. Then Krishna says, Jai. <laughs> now you're ready to surrender. <laughs> so, of course, you know, times have changed. <laughs> And that mood is not as strong as it used to be, but that's what spread Krishna consciousness. And that's what spread Krishna consciousness. We were young, you know. We, many of our, well, I, we were many of your ages. We were teenagers, early twenties. Some of us were late twenties, and so the energy was there, and Prabhupada's presence was there, and, and he inspired that enthusiasm, like that, and so. The mood was to do whatever Prabhupada asked. And he was pushing his disciples, really. Sometimes he would tell us, uh, I have this project for you to do. He would come to a temple or to a, to a devotee and he said, I want you to do this service. And the, the devotee would think, oh, okay. What service should I stop in order to do the Prabhupada, no, what do you mean stop? You just simply add this service. That's, you don't stop anything. <laughs> so, uh, when Prabhupada, because, he was, because of his purity, and because he was working just as hard as the devotees, and that was the thing. He never simply pushed the devotees to give more and more. He was always doing the same thing also traveling around the world, writing books, meeting important people, also sacrificing his own personal health in order to do that, a lot of it. So he was an inspiration by example for what the devotees wanted to do. So the spiritual master has to be in that mood also. Not that they tell the disciples to do everything and then they sit in their room and read all day. <laughs> That's nice too, but they also have to be there, inspiring the devotees, encouraging the devotees, and showing the example how to surrender also. When Srila Prabhupada would do his translations of the Srimad Bhagavatam, he would, uh, he would start. Prabhupada said, I used to take rest every night between 10.30 and 11, and then I would wake up at 12 sometimes 12.30. So he would sleep for an hour and a half, two hours. And then he would get up with his dictaphone. He'd have this volume, which was the commentaries of the other acharyas on the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam. He would study their commentaries and then give his own commentary in the form of uh, understanding what is the mentality of the Western disciples. Because he, he understood that the Western mentality was a little bit different than the Vedic culture as was given in the, the scriptures. And Prabhupada always tried to understand that and, and present that along with the philosophical teachings that he was translating. And then he would translate sometimes from 12.30, 1 o'clock to about 4 in the morning. And he would chant Japa from about four to six, six o'clock he would call his devotees. 
They would go out on a morning walk. Prabhupada would walk usually for an hour or maybe a little less. They wind up at the temple at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning to greet the deities. And Prabhupada would sit on the Vyasa sun, give the class, and then he would go back to his place, take a little breakfast and take a little rest. And then he would get up after maybe an hour or so of resting. Prabhupada never slept. <coughs> they said he would, if you were in the room when he was apparently sleeping, he knew everything you were doing also. <laughs> he never really slept, but he was resting like that. And so after an hour he would get up and then he would, uh, he would uh, call his secretary and he would, he would read the letters that Prabhupada got. And he would respond to the letters, and they would write his response and send out the letters. Then Prabhupada would call his uh, personal servant, and he would get a massage for about an hour and a half to two hours. <laughs> and then after that, uh, we'd get close to lunchtime. I would take a, his uh, afternoon shower, come out, and then they would offer him prasadam. Take some prasadam. Prabhupada always took prasadam alone. When I was in Los Angeles, they showed me where Prabhupada's place for eating. It was a little table facing the wall. <laughs> he wouldn't talk to anyone because he understood that Prashadam was Krishna. And therefore he wanted to honor Prashadam in that way. And sometimes if there were some important guests that came at that time, he would also meet with them. But that was rare. And usually he would meet with guests later on in the day and throughout the evening. And so, yeah, so Prabhupada followed that. And, and then he'd take a little bit of rest after lunch again, and then he'd get up and then go on with general preaching or meeting devotees or traveling or whatever he had to do. And so I was using Prabhupada as the example. Although he was pushing his devotees, he was also pushing himself. And, you ha and if, you're, if anyone's in the position of a spiritual master, it's not like they're just sitting there simply giving orders of philosophy. They're also there fully engaged in, in their own service to the spiritual master. So they teach not only by their words, but also by their example, like that. And when Srila Prabhupada was in his last days, he was somewhat debilitated physically. He still was preaching. He still wanted to travel. He still wanted to meet devotees. He still wanted to get more of his books out before he left. So he, he was like, no one could keep up with him. <laughs> the devotees would even say that. He, he, he's in his 70s, and we were like in our late 20s the most. And when Prabhupada would walk, the devotees would run next to him. <laughs> Sometimes he wouldn't even touch the ground, they'd say. He would be walking so fast. So he was teaching also by example, not that he was trying to show off his position. He was teaching that a spiritual master is also one who is teaching by example and not simply by words, <laughs> like that. Yeah, so that's a very important part of a guru's uh, service to his devotees. He not only shows the way, but he goes the way, too. <laughs> yeah. And that way you can understand what is a spiritual master, by his example and by his words also. And so I'll ask you a question. And this was a question that was posed in the Srimad Bhagavatam. When Narada Muni came upon Dhruva Maharaj, who was in the forest, Dhruva Maharaj had been offended by his stepmother when he tried to sit on his father's lap, who was the king at the time. His stepmother said, he, he has no right to sit, only my son. And she became angry at him, and his father agreed with his stepmother. And so he, he was a five-year-old boy, but he, was a, he had a very fiery nature as a five-year-old boy, born in a Kshatriya family. So he went, he went complaining to his mother, his mother said, well, actually, uh, whatever you want in life, you can find in God. She, he said, where can I find God? In the forest. Immediately left home, 
And he went to the forest to perform austerities and different penances to try to find God. When Narada Muni saw this young boy doing that, he tested him. He tested him. By saying, you're you just a young boy. You're five years old. You know, you have to live out your childhood. Play for a while and get a little older. Then you can get serious and spiritual life. Narada wasn't really believing what he was saying. He was testing. So this is another point. The spiritual master has to test the disciple to see. Just like I was talking to one very nice lady in London. And she was, she wanted to join the Hare Krishna movement. She wasn't married at the time. So her spiritual master said, well, before you join, you should spend one year in the ashram as a ashram devotee. And for her, it was something that she didn't want to do. <laughs> but that was the instruction. And though because she was attached to that spiritual master, she took it and said, she told me later, and this was after many years, she said it was the best thing I ever did. I learned so much and I grew actually so much spiritually in that, in that environment like that. So the point was that the spiritual master, his duty is to test the disciples, put a little pressure. They say if you want to make a diamond, you take cold and pull it under pressure and then after so many years the cold transforms into a diamond. Of course that's for a long time. But that the example is there, a little pressure is good. Well, we don't like pressure sometimes. We <laughs> want to take it easy, you know. Yeah, I'll chant, dance, and, you know, read some books once in a while. And I'll check out my Guru Maharaj, see what he's doing when his birthday's coming. And I'll get him a nice present. <laughs> but that's not a disciple. A disciple always is always eager to get more instructions from the spiritual master or to help fine tune the instructions they already have so they can increase the quality of their devotional service. So Dhruva Maharaj was being tested by Narada and he told him, he told Narada, what you're saying is nice but I'm not a Brahmin. I'm, I'm a Kshatriya. I, I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> And Narada Muni was very happy because he passed the test. <laughs> he passed the test. Now Prabhupada, in one, one uh, uh, verse in that same section, uh, poses a question. And I'll ask you the question. Uh, some people say that Krishna consciousness is easy. And some people say Krishna consciousness is difficult. So what is it? Yes. I believe it's easy if, uh, based on my experience, hmm. it's easy when you just actually believe 